Good morning. My name's Eugene. I'm the directional pastor here. If you're a guest, welcome. Uh, I've always been called Eugene. Uh, that was my name given at birth. It was a bit of a, a change up. Up until weeks before I was born, my parents were going to call me Andre, and then they had a change of heart, and I became Eugene. And I've lived with it ever since, and uh, except in third grade, I decided for a short while I wanted to be something else. My second name is Clive, and I thought, well, we'll just give that one a whirl. And so we were sitting first day of school, and the teacher does what a teacher does, and reads through roll, and uh, calls out name, and the kid will say, yeah, that's me. And the teacher's able to put a face with a name, and came to Eugene Bront, B, comes early. Uh, I said, yes, that's me, but I'd like to be called Clive. She seemed non-committal and carried on. <laughs> Went out to recess. All my friends said, hey, Eugene. They weren't playing along. Went back to class, and the teacher spoke to me. It was Eugene. It never took hold. Right? And I realized at that point, when your story is written, it's pretty much set. There are parts of it that are established. They're scoured into into history and that's the way of it and so i was reading a novel just a, a week or two ago and i came across the line and uh, it caught my attention and i started thinking about it because it corresponded with my experience and with the experience of so many others and, and this is it it said you can't start over all you can do is change direction and it caught my imagination so much that I took a picture of it. It was an electronic book. And I've gone back to it a number of times, and I've pondered it, and I've thought it, and I've said, you know what? I think this sounds reasonable. This seems reasonable. You can't undo what's happened. You can't start over. We may want to change things, but yeah, we can only change direction. We can't change origins. Those are established. But then you can change direction. Now you can make choices. Our choices are meaningful. They matter. And they do plot a new course. You make a new decision on a new day. And you decide, I'm not going to drink anymore. Or I'm going to lose weight. Or I'm going to have a career change. I'm going to enroll in, in family counseling. Whatever it might be. Those changes can make a significant difference in the very trajectory of your life. You'll end up somewhere different. So I looked at it and I thought to myself, you can't start over. All you can do is change direction. That seems right. But is it biblical? Because ultimately, all truth is determined by how it relates to Scripture. So I've been thinking about it, and I'd like you to think with me. Open your Bibles, and we're in Luke, Luke chapter 7. Here we hear a story about a few people, and their experience will give us some perspective on this quote. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, him being Jesus. So this Pharisee, later we find his name is Simon, invites Jesus to come and eat with him. And Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. These people knew how to do it in the ancient world. When you ate there, you didn't sit at the table. You lay on your side, your head propped up in your left hand eating with your right hand, with your feet stretched out behind you. Keep that in mind when Thanksgiving rolls around. Right? <laughs> and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. Okay, so we have two different people here. They're very, very different. Jesus, it's a story about him. But the other characters are very significant. You have a Pharisee. And if you're familiar enough with the New Testament and you come across the term Pharisee, you know what's coming. There's going to be conflict. These people seem to be the burr in the side of Jesus. They're always causing consternation, difficulty. They're uptight. They're rigid. They're argumentative. They're never content. And so you see Pharisee and you think, troublemaker, problem. 
in the ancient world, that's not the way people saw Pharisees at all. Pharisees were people of great esteem. Has to be in the story, right? Jesus is a teacher. He has got all kinds of accolades because of his teaching and his miracles. And everybody would want him to come to their table. But this man wins. Why? Because everyone defers to his status. He's a Pharisee. And you, what is a Pharisee? It's a religious sect. We know that. Right? There are multiple Jewish sects. There were the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Pharisees, the three big sects of the Jewish times. But what did it mean to be a Pharisee? Simply put, the Pharisees were a brotherhood or league of devout Jewish men. To be a Pharisee, you had to make a vow in front of three witnesses to follow the law and the oral traditions of the Jewish faith and avoid scrupulously any kind of sinful people or behavior. Okay. So do right and avoid wrong. And this brotherhood, this league, actually that's where Pharisee comes from, the word brotherhood. This brotherhood was mutually accountable. So when you think of the Pharisees, in essence, it's this massive accountability group where you say, I'm going to live life above board. I'm going to have the standard of excellence, and I'm held accountable to my brothers. And so everything I do is visible. Right? So I'm going to be uh, paying my tithe. I'm going to be concerned about temple practices. I'm going to keep the Sabbath holy. And all of this is done visibly so I can be accountable to my brotherhood. And simultaneously, I'm going to be diligent in avoiding any kind of sinful aspects of society. And because of those choices, people who were Pharisees were highly esteemed. Because these are devout rigorous people in their faith it's not something you're born into we shouldn't see a pharisee as someone who's born into privilege there's no privilege here what you have is a person who's made a choice that's a public choice and it has written chapters into his life where he has lived rigorously and has earned people's approval as a result it's set He's able to go to Jesus and say, come dine with me because he has the prerogative. He has the status all because of that choice he made. At the same time, in this place, we have a sinful woman. That's just a euphemism. It's a polite way of saying she's a prostitute. This is a woman who sells her body to men or access to her body. And that's how she makes her living. In our day and time, prostitutes are considered with disdain, contempt, compassion, all the more in the ancient world, right? Few people would ever choose to be a prostitute. In the ancient world, fewer still. It's almost certain that this woman ended up in this profession because of hardship. Her options were few. And so we should have compassion. Jesus certainly does. But she's still culpable. She's still responsible for that choice. There were other choices. Read the book of Ruth. There's a woman who's indigent, she's got nothing, and yet she chooses a righteous path. So I, I have enormous compassion for whatever circumstance she was in, but she has exacerbated her situation by making wrong choices. And because of it, she's, she's socially scarred, right? I mean, her, her story's been written, chapters have been written, and, and she's now labeled. She is a sinful woman. These are how these two people are measured in society. One's a sinful woman, she's a prostitute, and the other is a Pharisee, he's a righteous man. Can you imagine his horror when she comes into his house? He has this esteemed guest at his table, and the very thing he's sworn to avoid, any kind of impropriety, walks embodied in this woman into his place. That's how we start the story. So in the story, you've got two people that are established in their station, their status. You can't start over. They can't. She's a prostitute. He's a Pharisee. That's settled. The next question, though, is can they change? Can direction change? Jesus sees all of this going on. And I find this highly ironical, right? 
because this Pharisee looks at Jesus and goes, does he know who's touching him? If he were a Pharisee, he would, or a prophet, he would know she's a sinful woman. And Jesus does know. In fact, Jesus even knows what he's thinking. And so ironically, Jesus actually confronts what is unspoken. Verse 40, and Jesus answered, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. That's, that's a big difference. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Seeing this playing out, a woman in her station, right, She's condemned because of her choices. Another man who's esteemed, secure in his choices. This man feels like he's in right standing. This woman knows she is condemned. Jesus looks at it and addresses the issue and says, here's a story. There's a money lender. He has two debtors. Both of them cannot pay. That's important to note. They cannot pay. He forgives both of them their debts. Which loves him more? Well, the righteous person loves him less because the debt he owed is smaller. And you could read that and go, well, righteous people are incapable of loving. Or righteous people don't necessarily need to love to such a degree because their debt is smaller. It's not the point Jesus is making. Jesus has said they're both debtors. But righteous people very often are oblivious to their debt. They're not aware that they're indebted. The person who's in deep debt understands it and their gratitude, their expression is a reflection of their understanding. I know I'm in a world of hurt. The righteous are an equal amount of jeopardy. They can't pay. But they're deluded. What Jesus says to him is you're deluded. So we know these people are stuck in their situation. They don't fully understand their situation. Well, the one does, the other doesn't. He thinks he's secure. And then we have the opportunity for change. So let's keep reading. Jesus now confronts Simon. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. He now talks about the trajectory, the choices they're making in his presence. And they're very different. The woman's behavior is radical. She comes into a Pharisee's home. She knows she's not welcome. And what does she come into contact with? Jesus' feet. That's the only thing she has access to. The rest of his body is lying away from her. So there she stands at the feet of Jesus. She's weeping openly. She's deeply moved by the teaching of Jesus. And she feels from him a degree of love and acceptance she's never had. And as a result, the gratitude is just pouring from her in tears. It's, she's making a mess on his feet, realizing she's got to clean it up. She's no rags or anything. She kneels down, lets her hair down, another scandalous thing, and starts wiping his feet clean. With her brow that close to his feet, spontaneously overtaken by love, she starts kissing his feet. And then the ointment she brings, she anoints his feet. Now, I want to tell you, if I was in that room, I'd be all kinds of uncomfortable. I mean, th that kind of just blatant display of affection. I would totally miss what just happened. The Pharisees certainly did. But think about it. Here is a woman who's used all of these elements, her kisses, her hair, and perfumed anointment, as tools of her trade. 
These have all been used for despicable ends. And now she takes those very things and gives them in pure devotion to Christ Jesus. What was always deemed a sinful behavior is now offered in absolute worship to the one who's forgiven her. We have a word for that in Scripture. It's called repentance. It's where you take all of you, everything you love, everything that's been given to you, and you redirect it towards the person of Christ Jesus. She's in total repentance. Right? She's, she's giving everything to Christ Jesus. And when she stands, she's not the same person anymore. Because when she leaves, she's not a prostitute. She's not going to go and continue in that lifestyle. That's something that's part of her past. She's changed direction. And it's going to be a hard way. I and mean, she's cutting a difficult path. She doesn't have her clients anymore that she can benefit from financially. The Pharisees still won't accept her. But she has this one thing. The love of Jesus. And it's enough. It's enough for her. She realizes he is everything I've ever wanted and needed. Her entire trajectory changes. Right? Can you change direction? She does. This woman encounters Jesus. She can't rewrite her story, but Jesus is the change agent. And on his axis, she pivots out on a whole new trajectory to a new story. And I don't know what that story is, and one day we'll find out in glory, but it'll be an incredible story to be told of how meeting Jesus changed everything for this woman. What about the Pharisee? Jesus condemns him and says, Simon, I've come into your home, and you did not wash my feet. Didn't offer me a brotherly kiss. Did not anoint my head. And I can imagine Simon going, Mike, I have you in my home. What more do you want? I'm feeding you. I've done everything properly. Everything's correct. I have not. Okay, those things would be nice, but they're not obligated of me socially. Those are not obligations that I had to meet. I have done everything appropriately. That's his problem. There's all this proper behavior and no heart. I'm a pastor, and so that means I get to officiate weddings. And it gives me a great vantage point. Because at a wedding, I see things that other people sometimes miss. Normally, I'm standing here or in a place like this, and beside me is the groom. And the groom is prepared, right? And he's standing there in all his masculine glory. Here's a guy, you put him on a basketball court and his feet are like music. They just move in his hands and he's got all this dexterity and athletic prowess and he's ready for his bride and there he stands, tall and straight and strong. Music starts and the flower girl comes down, right? She's there to mess things up and so she does that properly. <laughs> Petals and whatnot. If she finds the wrong place, causes the disruption. She's the comedic relief. That's her job. Later on, we're in the reception, and it's time for the dance. And so the groom now walks up to his bride, his beloved, and does the opening dance. And they know this has been coming, and so he's been practicing. But all that dexterity and athletic prowess, it's gone. He holds her like a two-by-four. And with this wooden awkwardness, stomps through the movements. He's memorized them, and he's playing them out. And it's tragic to watch, right? Because he knows the movements, but he can't hear the music. His actions have no grace to them. That's the Pharisee. His entire religious life has been practicing the movements. But there's no grace in it. None whatsoever. Fortunately, the little flower girl's on the dance floor too, right? And she's got this little halo of flowers that are now a kilter in madness. And she's twirling like a, a, a raving dervish. She's enjoying the music. She has no idea what the steps are. She's doing her own thing, but she hears the music. She's, she, she's the prostitute in the story. She hadn't got anything right in the ceremony. 
But when the music comes on, she hears it. He's done everything right. But there's no grace to him. And so this Pharisee entertains Jesus and he does it just right. And Jesus says, your heart, there's no love in it. You don't get it. You don't see. You know what the story of the Pharisee is? We don't know, but it's most likely. The next day, he's just the same. And the day after that, he's still the same. And stubbornly, awkwardly, walks through the steps time and time again. You have the story. There's two. Neither of them can start over. Both of them meet Jesus. One of them changes direction. And it changes everything. But the best part of the story is how it ends. Because these people meet Jesus. And Jesus is a change agent. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus forgives her her sins. People get upset about that. You go back to chapter 5 of Luke, the same thing happens. He forgives sins. People didn't like it then. He doesn't have the prerogative in their eyes. Only God can forgive sins. Obviously, he is God in the flesh. They don't know that. But what happens is Jesus proves himself in chapter 5 through miraculous activities. He claims it for himself. He says, you see my earthly authority, but I'm going to present you my heavenly authority. I have every right to forgive sins. Jesus forgives sins. He takes the blame. He takes the debt, and he removes it. People are free from the the contamination of their life. Uh, some time back, some of the stylists in our church did a kind thing. We are very involved in Room in the Inn, which is a ministry to the homeless here in Jackson. And homelessness doesn't really allow for good hygiene or good grooming. Uh, they have no money, and so whatever they get, they will spend on other things, uh, whatever their need is in that moment. And so their hair grows ragged, their clothes become ragged, um, very often they become dirty just by doing life in this world. And so our stylists went and, and cut their hair and made themselves presentable so they could look for jobs. And this has been done before in other places. I've even seen a documentary. It was pretty telling where they found these people in one of the biggest cities of our country. And they, they went through the whole process. Right? They, they took them and they, they bathed them and took the, the dirt that was caked in the crevices of their wrinkles and their sunburned faces. They cut their hair, uh, trimmed their beards, uh, groomed them, uh, did to fingernails what people do to fingernails, and um, gave them a good suit of clothing and then sent them out into society. And the change was amazing, right? Because when you take all the dirt away, people responded differently to them. So you send them into a store where previously they would be chased out. Now they're called sir and ma'am. Right? They're treated with respect because they have a certain appearance that's appropriate. That's what forgiveness does. Forgiveness means that our relationship with God changes. Instead of seeing us as enemies, we become sons and daughters. But it does more than that. Right? <coughs> The thing that was the most moving in the documentary was how these homeless men and women felt about themselves. It wasn't just how society responded to them, but they saw themselves differently once the dirt that had caked been removed. That's what forgiveness does. Jesus says to her, go in peace. It's not just be at peace with God, be at peace with your fellow man, but be at peace with yourself. And the reason God can do this is because when he meets us and we move towards him in repentance, he doesn't just give us a new chapter. He throws the old book away and he starts a whole new story. See, this is totally true. You can't start over. All you can do is change direction. Unless that direction is towards Jesus and then he starts you over. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians. I'm talking about the change. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A new creation. The old has passed away. It's been chucked. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through 
Christ reconciled us to himself. That's the glorious story of what Jesus is doing here. He's looking at this woman and saying, go in peace. You're all together new. You have a whole new story to tell. And everybody else still said, oh, she's the sinner, she's the prostitute, or she used to be the prostitute. But God looks at her and says, all I see is daughter. There's an entirely new story that's being developed. This is so much a major theme in Scripture. It gets told time and time again. Uh, probably the most famous story of Jesus relates to this very theme, and that's the story of the prodigal son. In the prodigal son... You have a man, he's the father, he owns everything. You have two sons, the younger son, who's a hellion, he's the prostitute in the story. He wants to live a riotous life. He goes to the father and says, give me all that I'm going to get from inheritance. He takes it and he goes to a far country, squanders it, ends up tending pigs, shameful for a Jew, sitting in their sty amongst the swill, dirty, disheveled, and thinking there's a better way. And he goes back to the father. And what does the father say? Servant? No. Son. And he takes off the cloak and he puts a new cloak on him. And puts a new ring on him. And says, we're going to rewrite your story. Unfortunately, in the story of the prodigal son, there is another son. He's the older son. right? And he's the religious one. He's the dutiful one. He knows the dance steps. He's followed them all along. And when the riotous hellion of a son returns, he's mad because there is no grace in his life whatsoever. It's all about duty, observance, obligation, right behavior. He doesn't change. The only one that changes is the younger son who comes home in repentance, which leads us to you and I, right? Because some of you came in here and you're the riotous, hellion young son. You're the prostitute in the story. Others came in here and you've done it right. You followed the rules. You're the good Pharisee. You're the older son. Fortunately, God can change both. Here's another event that is recorded. This is in Acts chapter 26. Another Pharisee, an older brother, Someone who knows the dawn steps and has fulfilled them dutifully throughout his life. He's on a journey. And the bright light shines and knocks him from his horse. And he hears a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise, stand upon your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That's Saul. This is a man, he's the older brother, he's dutiful, he's been faithful in everything. He's a Pharisee. He's elite. And yet he encounters Jesus and his life becomes radically changed and he gets a new name. He's no longer Saul. He's Paul. And a whole new story gets written for him. The good news of the gospel is what Jesus does at Calvary allows for us not just to change direction, but to start again. Why don't you pray with me this morning? While your head is bowed, I want you to consider for a minute what you want to say to God. Some of you are indeed the younger child, and you are the rebellious one. You're the prostitute. Your sins may not be quite so notorious, but they're notorious enough. It's time for you to take your affections and your gifting and use it all to worship God. What you need is repentance. Others of you are the older child, you're the Pharisee, you're the one who knows the rules and has lived by the rules. But it's always been wooden. There's never been any grace. 
you get to repent too. You get to say, Lord, I want to see you, not just the lifestyle. I want to know you. And so let us together pray this. Lord God, I am a sinner. You know my sins. I know my sins. And I repent. Whether it be pride or rebellion, forgive me. Lord, don't just change the direction of my life. Change me altogether. Make me altogether new. I believe in you. Amen.